think as a parent, how you talk about yourself in front of your kids is so important because they watch everything. I've never thought, oh, as a woman, I can't because I've always seen women done things and know that they can. Mm -hmm. So I think especially as a mother, it's so important that your daughter see you breaking those glass ceilings, seeing you showing up, going after your dreams and being confident because they go, wow, if mommy can do it, I can do it too. And it's scientifically proven. And that's the power of role models, right? So first thing I would say is make sure that you are living the life that you want because before you are a mother, before you are a wife, before you are anything, you are you. You are an individual that has needs, that has wants, that has desires, and you deserve to live those out. Meet Tiwa Lola Ogunlesi, a globally recognized and qualified life coach, international speaker, positive psychology specialist, author, podcast host, and founder of Confident and Killing It. Confident in Killing It was founded in 2017 to help girls and women overcome the very issues that she faced. Tiwa's live events, workshops, and coaching programs help women worldwide unlock their most confident selves. She launched her podcast in 2020 to amplify her method of empowerment, reaching a global audience. It's currently ranked as Spotify's top 5% most shared podcast in the UK, with listeners in over 200 countries. Her resilience is transformative, and her mission is unwavering to empower women. Hi everyone, my name is Tiwalala Ogunlesi, and I am on the Behind the Dreams podcast. Hey. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you for coming on my podcast. My pleasure, Claude. I'm yeah. glad to be here. Now, we've been wanting to get you on for a little while now, so nice. glad we finally made it work out. Yes, 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 yes. Let's do it. The stuff. I have a few more questions for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, my first one, nice and easy. Okay. Would you rather live in Nigeria or the UK? Oh, no, you can't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will go with Nigeria. Why is that? Because of the sunshine. Mm. And I feel like there's more opportunity to get help. I feel like when I'm in Nigeria, I work really hard, but at least there's less life admin. Whereas when I'm in the UK, I'm working really hard and I still have to like do all the cooking and the post office runs and go get the groceries and mm. all of these things. And I just feel like at least in Nigeria, there's like enjoyment and you still work. Whereas in the UK, it just feels like struggle central sometimes. And <laughs> you're okay living in Nigeria, even though you can't win a football final. Ah, <laughs> wow. I should have seen that too. <laughs> Well, at least we got to the finals, unlike <laughs> some people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm not involved in it. Yeah, totally, exactly. totally different continent. <laughs> okay, next one. When it comes to you making big decisions, okay. do you prefer to rely on your logic or your intuition? Ooh. I feel like everyone goes like, you know, just trust your intuition, which is fair enough, but I'm very much a break it down, logical person. Like, I want to see it add up. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to see here. I'm going to see there. And then when the logic is making sense, I'll just check that my intuition is aligned with it too. But I kind of lead with logic first. So that's an interesting answer because I've always believed that people make decisions based on their, lo not their logic, their emotion rather. Okay. And then they tend to then apply logic later to make oh. it seem like it was a logical <laughs> one. But you, yeah, no. you don't feel like you do that. No, I definitely start with like, yeah, I definitely start with logic and then I go ahead and then my intuition will kind of tell me if it's like, mm, is this what you really want to be doing? Mm versus just like seeing what my intuition is seeing because i feel like with intuition it can be so like is it like good emotion is, is it sometimes bad emotion is it intuition there's a lot going on there in terms of emotion so yeah. i like to just look at the facts and the logic and then when i have a clearer picture I can listen to what my body is telling me around that plan that I have. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Okay. Do you prefer yeah. giving tough love or gentle encouragement? 
Oh, it depends to who. Mm. Uh, do I prefer tough love or gentle encouragement? Mm. All right, let's start with this. Okay. When you're receiving, which is more effective for you? I like gentle encouragement, I would say. And I was <laughs> I was having this conversation with my partner because I was talking to him about a business idea. Mm. And he's very, like, very, like, logic, very, like, does this make sense? Yeah. And so he was giving me feedback like we were in Lion's Den or Dragon's <laughs> Den. And I'm like, bro, I'm your wife, okay? <laughs> like, sprinkle a little bit of, you know, that's a great idea, babe, even if it, you don't think it's a great idea, <laughs> yeah. Um, and he was like, I'm sorry, it's a business idea. I just look at it for the business. And I'm like, I get it, but I'm still your wife. So, you know, so for me, I definitely think gentle... Um, encouragement is good but if you see someone making the same mistakes then you do need a bit of tough love and right. i'm not afraid to give the tough love like i will drag you a little bit but mm. it's a gentle drag it's a nice drag it's yeah. a drag that wakes you up to really rethink your life especially as a coach i have to do those things i can't just let my client give me excuses all the time i have to come with a little bit of tough love so yeah fair does that Kirsty, do you find yourself making the same mistakes over and over again um, not really, but I would say the only mistake I make over and over again is thinking I can take on more than I can handle. Mm. I don't know what the delusion is, but I just always think I can make it work. Like yeah. I could just always think I can pile up my schedule and nothing bad will happen. Everything will go according to plan. Yeah. But something always kind of like oh i end up missing a meeting or i end up you know being too ill to reach one of my deliverables and so i'm really really trying not to make that mistake but i would say apart from that i i'm pretty good with not making the same mistakes fair is that potentially linked with uh, confidence that you believe you can do all of that mm, is it linked with confidence more ambition mm -hmm. More like I have so many things I want to do and I have I just have this idea that I can handle it on. I guess it is linked with confidence that, yeah, I can handle it and maybe it might be poor time management, too. <laughs> a little bit of poor time management because I things take so much longer than mm. they actually do. So because I love what I do so much, I don't actually realize how much time it takes me to do certain things. Mm. So I'm just like, oh, this presentation, oh, I already know what I'm going to say. I can whip it out in 30 minutes. And then it ends up taking two hours because I'm thinking of this and I'm going through this and I'm like, oh, I really want to make sure this point lands. And so I think I just need to be more honest with myself about yeah. how long things actually take rather than just thinking, oh, I can smash this out of the park. Yeah. Okay. Last icebreaker for you. Okay. What is the best advice you've ever been given? Oh, I feel like I should know this. <laughs> What's the best advice I've ever been given? I mean, oh, yes, I do know the best advice I've ever been given. So... Uh, I met this lady at a conference and um, we became friends and we just kept in touch. So she's a couple of years older than me. She's been running her business for a while. And I remember she lives in San Francisco. So she was visiting in London and we went for coffee. And um, I was talking to her. This was December of 2019. I was about to thinking of, you know, quit quits my full-time job and run confident and killing it full-time so I was speaking to her about it and how nervous I was and she said don't underestimate what you're going to unlock when you take that leap of faith to bet on yourself mm -hmm. because at the time I didn't have any clients lined up I didn't have a business plan I didn't have income coming in recurrently from this side hustle so on paper it did not make sense to quit my job and be a full-time entrepreneur. But she said that when you take that leap of faith to bet on yourself, that's when the doors start flooding open. That's when the opportunities start coming in. Because, and I, and I really agree, because the universe also knows how much you can handle. God also knows how much you can handle. So 
if you don't let go of something, you don't create more room for the greatness to start to come in. So I had to leave that job to create the brain space and to unlock the creativity that would allow my business to succeed. So yeah, once she told me that, I was like, right, let's do it. Let's bet on ourselves because I'm about to unlock something, but you don't know what you're going to unlock until you actually do it. Yeah. So yeah. So that's interesting. And I say that because that's now almost the opposite advice that I give people oh, really? these days. <laughs> yeah. And I know this is one of the things that you do is that you do help encourage people to yeah. get their side hustles to a point where they can leave their job. Yeah. Um, and I'm similar, but I tend to tell people to stay in their job for as long as possible. Until the side hustle's working, right? Even beyond it's working, oh, to be really? honest with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it just depends. I've spoken to a lot of different people about this. And some people, I left with only three months worth of savings. Mm. And so I gave myself the deadline to say, okay, after three months, I've got to turn this into a sustainable business, right? So that was my pressure. Some people will rather wait till they have, you know, a comfortable amount and then they'll do it. Or some people might just be happy working the two at the same time. Mm. Um, for me, how I knew it was time to leave my full-time job was because I started to get anxiety when I would go into the office, and I never get anxiety. And so something in me, my intuition, my higher self was telling me, right, your time is up here, your time is up here. And so I didn't really have the desire to look for another job because I just wanted to give confidence and killing it everything that I had. And so with some people, depending on what your side hustle is, you know, you can make the two work. But I feel like for me, having such a front facing career, um, I just had to give it my all. And it mm. made sense because 2020 was the year everyone needed a life coach. Everyone was having some sort of crisis with the pandemic. What's my next move? What's going to happen? And if I was working a full time job and doing what I was doing, there's no way I would have been able to handle it. Yeah. I would have been so burnt out. So I think you have to decide what's the nature of your side hustle. Is it really um, demanding in terms of your, you showing up? You know, for me, I have to show up to speak. I have to show up for coaching. If it's a product-based business and, you know, it just runs behind the scenes, then I would say, yeah, you know, definitely you can keep your full-time job. But I think, yeah, it just depends on the nature of the business. Okay. So we've spoken a little bit about what it is that you do, Confident and Killing It. Yeah. Um, just for clarity, what is Confident and Killing It? And second question to that is yeah. what actually is a confidence coach? Okay, good question. So Confident and Killing It is a purpose-driven organization that aims to help give people the practical skills and tools they need to overcome fear, unlock their most confident self, and live out their biggest dreams. So we're all about building a community of women and creating positive and practical tools that people can use to master their mind, believe in themselves and show up in the world. And so there's a book, there's a podcast, there's a community. And then I also go into organizations to do um, talent development and trainings and do keynotes for companies. So that's kind of an overview of what the business is. Now, what a confidence coach is, um, is essentially I'm a trained life coach. So coaching is all about understanding where are you now and where do you want to go? So whereas therapy kind of looks at um, who were you before to understand how you are now, coaching is very much about where are you now, where do you want to go, and how are you going to get there? And it's my job as your coach to ask you questions to help you change your perspective. Because oftentimes, people are stuck in life where this is their challenge and they're looking at their challenge head on. My job as a coach is to grow you by waking you up to certain things about yourself, to opening you up to new perspective, to teaching you skills about how to deal with negative thoughts so that you can overcome the challenges that come your way. So I trained as a life coach and I specialize in positive psychology and I decided to call myself a confidence coach in particular because that's where my story comes from. I was insecure when I was younger. I learned that confidence can be practiced. It's not something you're just born with. Some confidence is something you can learn, you can teach yourself the same way you teach yourself how to drive or how to swim. You can teach confidence. And when I 
taught myself how to be confident and I noticed how much love and happiness and joy I was getting. I was like, everyone deserves to have this. And so that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to be a confidence coach to help women understand how to reprogram their mind for success so they have a mind that loves them and believes in them a mind that you know encourages them to take action and not a mind that sabotages them okay why only women um great question so in the beginning it wasn't just for women um it was kind of for everyone but what i noticed was when i would go into universities for example because that's where my speaking kind of started i would go into universities and i would give a talk and then i would say does anyone have any questions and it was always the guys that put their hand up first and asked the questions and then the whole conversation was just the guys and me having having going back and forth with the Q&A and mm -hmm. never the women. And I began to realize that as soon as there were men in the room, there was a shift in the dynamic. The women always kept quiet and the men always did the talking. And if you ever go for an event, you will often see that the first person to ask a question at an event is a man. And it usually takes about two to three men before a woman stands up to ask a question. And usually she doesn't even stand. She sits to ask the question. Yeah. And so I intentionally wanted to create a safe space where women can practice being confident in this safe space before going out into the real world. So, so yeah. Cool. I mean, guys listen to the podcast too. So mm -hmm. even my book, there are men who listen to my book. I got a message from a man in India that my book helped him with mental health and depression. So the work I do, the, the skills, the tools are applicable to everyone. Mm -hmm. But I do have a special place for women because I know we experience more challenges in this area. Why is it do you think that women have more of their challenges in that area? Yeah, so many reasons. So there's actually been data done on the confidence gap between men and women. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes from society and how we raise girls versus how we raise boys. So boys are allowed to play and be messy and, you know, be naughty. But girls are taught to, like, always be tidy and make sure their hair's done. And, you know, um, their uniform's always clean. And, and they have to be the good girls. And then they get a star and things like that. So girls are socialized to be be good to be well behaved to not take risks to not speak up too much whereas boys are encouraged to go out and be playful and you know take risks and try new things and be adventurous whereas girls are taught to play safe and so that psychology as you grow up you get to a place where um, women tend to internalize things and to shrink back whereas men tend to go forward and try new things and be adventurous and one of the biggest things they noticed was that when things go wrong um, men will say oh that exam was hard or that situation was hard but women will go oh I'm not smart enough that's why I failed that exam and so we internalize it as it being a worth issue, it being an intelligent is, intelligence issue. But men is more just about, oh, I didn't try hard enough. Or like, you know, they never doubt their capabilities, whereas women tend to do. And also in marketing that we receive, women are constantly fed images of how they need X, Y, Z to feel worthy to feel good enough if they don't have this cream or makeup or you know this bag or that outfit they are not worthy enough so women are constantly fed this messaging that worth is external and worth has to do with external things and external validation and so a lot of people don't realize that their worth is intrinsic mm. and one of the things i love to say to people is you matter simply because you exist it is a universal truth for every single person. You don't matter because of how much money you have or the color of your skin or where you live or the university you went to or the grades that you got. You know, the fact that you're alive and you're breathing means that you matter. So your starting place is that you are worthy, you are good enough, and you're on a journey to, you know, evolving and growing and things like that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of what you say that I do completely recognize and... I think the stats and the reality shows it. Yeah. But there's only one area that I want to push back on this a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You said that women are only receive messages in terms, not only, but receive a lot of messages showing mm -hmm. them that they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that's also true for men? Um, I don't see that as much. Just 
personally in mm-hmm. the media that I consume in magazines. You know, a lot of the weight loss stuff is is projected at women. If you look at women's magazines, ideal standards of beauty, for example, usually pushed at women. Anti-aging stuff, usually pushed at women. So it's like... Um, even even this idea of like a dad bod is cool and sexy when a man is in his like older age and he's not as you know fit as he should be looking but you never hear of a mom bod and you know if anything it's like you're meant to be this image your whole life and that's why so many women um, feel challenges when they have babies because they're like oh i need to snap back and things mm. like that. And we're the ones who've had the babies. Meanwhile, men are just allowed to exist their whole life without, you know, and, and any kind of look that they want can be made cool. Whereas women are, are always kind of meant to follow these like strict fashion regimes or like this strict like ideas of what a good body is. And it's so important that we have to break free from that. And I'm I'm seeing a movement, I'm seeing a change, you know, there's the body positivity movement, body neutrality, so I'm seeing the changes in that. And I also want to say that, you know, confidence isn't just a woman's issue, so don't get me wrong. Men do experience imposter syndrome, men do experience confidence issues, some some men experience self-sabotage, it's not just a woman's issue. So that's that's for sure I want to I wanna point out, but I guess what I do see is that... What, what I was saying before, that women will internalize things. So if you look at what confidence is, confidence is an in-depth belief in yourself and your ability that you can take action on your dreams and your goals, okay? So even if you don't know all the answers, you still believe you are capable of taking action on your dreams and your goals. Mm -hmm. So men will tend to feel the fear, but do it anyways. They know that they have self-doubt in this area, but they're still going to take action. Whereas with women, if we don't tick all the boxes, we're not going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been studies to show that when it comes to applying for a job, you know, women will wait till they tick 100% of the requirements before they apply, whereas men will be fine ticking 60 and figure it out as they go along Mm -hmm. right so so it's like yeah they still have their insecurity like hey i might not get this job but let's see and they go for it whereas a woman will go oh i don't meet all the requirements i might not get this job let me not even bother applying yeah that's the key area i want to get women to start taking action even when you don't feel fully ready even when you don't have all the answers even when you don't tick all the boxes Mm -hmm. just take a chance just take action because that's where you begin to build your confidence i agree um as i often find myself telling people you do miss 100 percent of the shots that you don't take and it i can say that i see men take a lot more shots that's the reality yeah exactly so a lot of what you're talking about seems like it stemmed from people's childhoods the way that they were raised the way things that they were taught things of that nature Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of our audience now they're having daughters they're having sons Mm -hmm. um but particularly for those of daughters are there any particular things that they can and should be thinking about or doing to help change and break this pattern so by the time that they're our age these are not the same battles that they're facing absolutely i think parents how you talk about yourself in front of your kids is so important because they watch everything like i remember when i was younger you know my mom would look in the mirror and squeeze her thighs and then as i was growing up when i saw my thighs looked like my mom's thighs i was like oh there must be something wrong with my thighs because if mommy doesn't like her thighs then and my thighs look like mommy thighs then my thighs might be bad you know so it's so important that your kids also see you being kind to yourself and compassionate to yourself and in the same way you know i saw my mom going to work after school i would go to her office and see her Um, my mom is a um a businesswoman in nigeria she produces um garments and children's clothing and she started selling pajamas from the boots of her car and now she's built um, a huge organization in nigeria with over 20 stores across the country you know so in those early days i would go and see her at work and she would try some of the designs on me and i saw as her business went from you know one small basement into a two-story into a five-story and so just seeing that journey 
of her following her dreams made me believe that anything is possible. So I've never thought, oh, as a woman, I can't because I've always seen women done things and know that they can. Mm -hmm. So I think especially as a mother, it's so important that your daughter see you breaking those glass ceilings, seeing you showing up, going after your dreams and being confident because they go, wow, if mommy can do it, I can do it too. And it's scientifically proven. And that's the power of role models, right? So first thing I would say is make sure that you are living the life that you want because before you are a mother, before you are a wife, before you are anything, you are you. You are an individual that has needs, that has wants, that has desires, and you deserve to live those out. So make sure that you are living the life that you want. And then secondly, make sure that you're kind to yourself, the way you speak to yourself, the way you treat yourself, uh, the way you show up in your family. Using those words is very important. So one of the things that I've noticed quite often mm -hmm. is when you're perceived as being confident or when you actually are confident, mm -hmm. a lot of people tend to forget the fact that you can also struggle yourself. Mm. Um, I would consider myself a pretty confident person, but mm. I still have had my moments of doubt. Yeah. Have you experienced anything like that? <laughs> yes, like every single time, like which one, <laughs> where should I go? Mm. Um, yeah, like I said, confidence is not the absence of fear and insecurity or self-doubt. Confidence is feeling those things and doing it anyway. So I have my fair share of self-doubts and insecurities. You know, um, I took some time off work last year. Loads of stuff was happening in my personal life and, you know, trying to come back into it. And, you know, my negative thoughts were telling me like, you know, oh, you're kind of irrelevant now. There's so many other people now making videos on confidence, you know, like what's the point in even trying? Uh, got multiple rejections last year, got so nominated for so many different awards, didn't get any of them. So, yeah, you still, life still hits you. It's not about will you get hit or not. It's about when you do get hit. It, how do you bounce back so yeah being a confident person doesn't make you immune to things happening or self-doubt or insecurities like I still have my fair share of insecurities and self-doubt but what I've learned how to do is question them is get curious about them when I think oh I'm not relevant anymore I ask myself is like is that 100% true or are you making an assumption right now? Mm -hmm. And when I ask myself that, I'm like, I have no evidence that shows me I'm no longer relevant. So why would I believe that voice in my head that is telling me I'm not relevant, you know? And then I ask myself, okay, does this thought sabotage you or does it empower you? Telling myself I'm no longer relevant doesn't encourage me to keep going. It makes me want to give up. So it's sabotaging. So mm -hmm. why would I listen to a voice that is taking me away from my dream? So I'm like, okay, what do you want to, what do you want to hear instead? What do you want to believe instead? Because you literally become what you believe. And then I'm like, okay, what would you say to a friend that is going through something similar? And I would, I would never say to someone, oh, you took time off work. So now you're irrelevant. Like I would never say that, you know, I would say, you know, you know, life happens in seasons no one else is your competition it's you and your life so take the time you need and then come back and the people who care about what you have to say will still be there and if some people have moved on they've moved on and that's life you know so yeah I definitely face my fair share of insecurities but I always kind of I acknowledge it I take it in that I'm feeling insecure in this area and then I do something about it I never just let myself wallow or sit in insecurity you know mm -hmm. So it all starts with that acknowledgement and then yeah. almost challenging your own thoughts. Like yeah. you say, like, I, is this thought correct? And yeah. if it, if whether or not it is correct, what am I going to do about it? Exactly. So that's chapter two of my book. I call it Get Sassy with the Mean Girl in Your Mind. <laughs> because so many women come to me and they tell me, oh, yeah, you know, I want to speak up more in meetings. But I just think, what if I say something stupid? And I'm like, OK, when you think you might say something stupid and it comes up in your head, what do you do? She just goes, oh, I just keep quiet. And I'm mm. like, 
how do you know that? How do you know you're going to say something stupid? We often go into our future and we think of the worst possible outcome, but the worst possible outcome isn't the only possibility available to you. And so I just tend to think, what other possibilities are there? And also learning that my mind is a battlefield, that really helped me. Because as a teenager, I just thought, oh, my mind is my mind. There's nothing I can do about it. But actually, your positive and negative thoughts are always fighting against each other. So you have to decide whether you want to win the battle or not. Mm. And I like to win. So once I knew that I could win the battle in my mind, I was like, right, let's go. What do I need? I'm ready. And so... Is, is that is exactly what it is. Your mind is a battle. Your positive and negative thoughts are fighting for your attention. Not every thought that comes into your mind is true. And it becomes a belief when you think about it often and you begin to act on it. So yes, I got a thought, oh, I'm no longer relevant. If I act on it, if I continue to think about it, then it becomes a belief of, of mine. But if I'm like, hang on a second... That's BS. That's sabotage. I'm going to write this down, rip it up, and throw it in the bin where it belongs. Then I can move on with my life. Okay. Thank you. One thing that I've known and experienced myself, and Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do as well, is that when your job or your business is about pouring into other people and supporting them with their goals and their growth and their development, we can often find that we empty ourselves out and then if from that point it becomes harder to mm-hmm. almost take our lives and our own thinking yeah. um, to the next level. Yeah. When you, well, have you experienced that firstly? Yeah. And if you have, what what's your journey with that? How do you move forward? Oh, yes, I have 100% experienced that. And that happened to me last, no, 2022 when I wrote my book. So before I wrote my book, I had been doing Confident and Killing It for about five years. So I had all this wisdom, all these tips, all these gems inside of me. And for some reason, when I wrote my book, it was like I poured my life and my soul into that book. And that is why it is so life changing. Anyone who reads my book is like, I feel like you're talking directly to me. It has this healing energy. And it's because I literally gave it every single thing inside of me. And then after I did, it was like, oh, now I'm empty. Mm. Because it was like, I I felt like I literally gave everything. And then I was like, oh, what else? What else do I have to say? What else can I think? Like, everything is in the book. Like, I have nothing more to give. I have nothing more to contribute because everything I've been working on for the past five years is now in this book and it's out there in the world. And it's like okay, so like, what do I do with myself, you know? And um, yeah, so I went through this journey of just like, am I still as smart? And even sometimes when I read my book, I'm like, who the hell wrote this? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm just like, I wrote this? I came up with this? How did I do it? And um, I think it's two things. I think as somebody who believes in faith, I definitely think, you know, you get that like, holy spirit kind of activating in you to like bring out some of this wisdom but then it's also what we call being in a state of flow and that's genius mode when you're in a state of flow you are 100 percent aligned with what you are doing and the reason why the book is so great because i was in a state of flow i could write 5,000 words in a day, literally, and I would lose track of time. And that's when you're in genius mode. You've lost track of time and you're pouring and it's all coming out. But then you have to fill yourself back up. And I didn't do that. After I wrote my book, then the next step was like, publish, you got to publish, you got to market it. And I thought I would have help with that, but I didn't. And so there I am kind of pushing, pushing, pushing to get the book out. And then I burnt out because I gave it my all. And then I have to find more energy to start pushing and promoting and pushing and promoting. And then getting speaker events to come and speak about the book and stuff like that. So there was never a point where it was like, okay, let's go back to reading some interesting things that you used to read or, you know, watching videos on YouTube or listening to podcasts. It was just always like, oh, you need to show up here. You need to say this. You need to do that. You need to promote the book. You need to talk about this. And it got me to a place where I felt really empty, empty in my heart, empty in my mind. And I just didn't want to create. I just didn't want to show up. And then I entered the dark hole 
of scrolling mm. and consuming and just taking in everything that people were doing on the internet and not doing anything that was actually feeding my mind. Yeah. I just got into this system of where I was just numbing, 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 numbing. And then, and this happened for like a whole year. And then at the end of 2023, I listened to a podcast on The Secret. I'm sure you know the book, The Secret. Yes. And it was talking about manifestation and how you attract these things has to do with your vibration. And I realized that I'd been living on a low vibration. I wasn't living in joy and happiness and love and enlightenment. Um, I was just existing. I was in survival mode. And so, of course, I wasn't manifesting anything. Of course, I wasn't attracting abundance into my life. And so last year, I made the decision to reclaim my power and get back to who I know I am and pouring back into myself. So that's kind of like the journey I'm now going in in terms of like reclaiming my joy and doing something every day that makes me happy, that makes me feel good because that is what I deserve, you know? Mm. So, yeah. Okay. Switching gears just a little bit now. Mm -hmm. You've spoken a lot about how confidence, self-perception, they all factor into building building up who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. But what I would love to know a little bit more around is how does your self-perception or the confidence that you have Mm -hmm. impact the relationships that you have with other people? Mm. I mean, I would say in a really positive way. Um, So another thing people think is that confidence is often arrogance, Mm. but it's not. Uh, Confidence is using your skills and your talents to lift other people up. When you're arrogant, you want to come up at the top and you want to push other people down. Mm. That's what arrogant people do. They want to feel big and make other people feel small. When you're a confident person, you know there's enough room for everyone to thrive. There's enough space for you to be good, for you to be good, for someone else to be good, for me to be good. And so as a confident person, I want nothing more than to see people win. I want to see my friends winning. I want to see the average woman winning, which is why I do what I do. The most heartbreaking thing I can ever see is knowing that there's a woman with a dream or somebody, not even just women, anyone who has a dream in their heart, who has something that they can bring to the world, but they're not doing it because of fear. Whether it's fear of judgment or fear of failure or what other people might think, nothing breaks my heart more. So I would say I have quite a positive relationship with people because as soon as I see you, I want to make you feel good about yourself. I want you to know that you are unstoppable, that you have potential, that I want to be your cheerleader, you know? And people often tell me they hear my voice in their head. Mm. (laughs) Like in those moments when they want to back down, they're just like, what would Tiwa say? And they hear my (laughs) voice and then they get going. And that's exactly what I want. And um, I remember at the end of one of my events, someone said, Tiwa, you're a boss, but you made me feel like I'm one too. And for me, that's just the most beautiful thing anyone can say to me. The fact that when you see me, you're not just thinking, oh, she's so great and I'm not. When you see me, you go, wow, she's so great and I can do it too. I can tap into that energy. And so for me, being a confident person, we lift other people up. We open the doors. We create opportunity to collab and to bring people together. Um, We don't make other people feel small. We don't just want to be the loudest person in the room and then no one else gets to say in anything confidence isn't about being the loudest person in the room it's about being secure in yourself and when you want to speak up you can speak up and say something you know you don't shrink back but confidence is not towering over everyone or you know making everyone feel more like less insignificant if your light is bright give that light to somebody else let's all shine our light together you know so i think you just said there sounds Almost exactly like you're describing being a good leader. Yeah. So my question would then be, can you be a good leader and not be confident? Is that possible? No, definitely not. Because how are people going to trust you? Confidence comes from trust. Trust in yourself and for other people's ability to trust that you can do what you say you are going to do. If you look at um, all our leaders in the world, not all of them are competent, right? But they come with this era and this vibe of confidence and people trust them. And it comes down to how you speak. If you speak with conviction, 
people are going to believe what you say. I can say the biggest, I mean, maybe not the biggest lie in the world, but I can say something that is so unfactual, but I can say it with confidence and with conviction. And somebody will be like, mm, you know, maybe, maybe I trust her. Maybe I trust what she's saying. And it could be totally wrong, you know? Mm. But if you, if you are saying something and you're just kind of like, yeah, I think it might be this or maybe that. I'm not really sure, but yeah, let's, let's just try and see. No one's going to believe that. Right. So I think with leadership, you have to be confident. You have to believe in what you're saying because that conviction is magnetic. That's what's going to attract people to you. Like people always say to me like, oh, T.Y., I've heard this stuff before, but the way you say it, it just sounds different. Mm. And it's because I break it down. I make it easy. I make it accessible. And you can tell when you hear me speak that I believe in every single thing that I'm saying, that I believe in this mission, that I want it so badly for another person to wake up and have the mind of freedom and love and confidence. I want that for you. And because of the way I communicate, that's how people are drawn and attracted to it. So as a leader, yes, visual communication is so important, vocal communication, and then verbal communication, what you actually say, those are the three Vs of communication, I would say, are very important, especially when it comes to being a leader and somebody who wants to be influential in their field. So we've spoken about confidence, we've spoken about leadership. Yeah. And we've spoken a little bit around the relationship with people in general, mm -hmm. but in a romantic sense, mm. can you have a healthy relationship if you are not confident yourself? Absolutely not. It is. You're, you're just asking for self-sabotage all the way. Um, and I'll say this because when you are not confident, you project a lot of your insecurities mm. onto other people. Yeah. And in a relationship, when you project your insecurities onto somebody else, it is going to cause a lot of tension. Mm. And then also you internalize every small thing as something being wrong with you. Yeah. So let's say, you know, your partner says something and um, you're not confident. You're automatically going to start going down a rabbit hole of, oh, maybe they don't really like me or maybe they are cheating on me or, you know, maybe they don't really want to be here. I'm just a tick box for them, da, da, da. And it will begin to affect your relationship with your partner. Mm. Another big thing, because I've been in, uh, I was in a relationship with my husband for 12 years before we got married. Mm. And communication is the number one reason we were able to stay in a relationship for that long because we can have difficult conversations with each other yeah. when something comes up and i'm feeling a type of way instead of just holding it in my head and coming up with all different scenarios i just say it to him head on like this is what i'm feeling from this situation this is the vibe that i'm getting let's talk about it and when you are a confident person you are assertive you're not passive P com people who aren't confident end up being passive they just say yes to everyone and everything they don't want to ruffle any feathers and so they end up being with a partner that either just walks all over them or doesn't set boundaries with them. Mm. And so they end up in this cycle of unfulfillment because they don't speak up for their needs. Um, they put their happiness in the hands of somebody else and um, they don't, yeah, they don't, they don't communicate properly, you know? So to make a healthy relationship work, you have to show up as your true authentic self. Yes. That was the last thing I was going to say. You have to know who you are, know what you like, know who you want to be in the world and be able to live that out and find a partner that is happy to be in alignment with that. I remember when I first started making videos, somebody actually messaged my partner and was like, oh, how do you feel if like Tiwa becomes more famous than you? What? I know. <laughs> like, honestly, can you imagine yeah. that? And he was just like, okay like you're so weird for that yeah. but again th that's why you have to also be with someone who wants to see your light shine mm. you know my husband shows up to all my events he's there he's rooting me on he shares all my videos he's not thinking oh wow she's getting famous and i'm so he's doing his own thing mm. just because it's not in the limelight doesn't mean he isn't his own person you know he he has his goals he has his ambitions he's working on that and so i think in a relationship 
both of you need to be comfortable in yourself so that when you see your partner shining, you don't get jealous of that. You don't start to feel insecure that, oh, they're going ahead and you're getting left behind. So confidence is key in terms of being able to support each other authentically. It's key in terms of communicating with each other properly, um, you know, and um, yeah, not projecting insecurities onto the other person that, that can cause a lot of trouble in the relationship that was good that was good um so yeah no i everything you just said i agree yeah. um for me it definitely struck a few nerves because mm. of um some past experiences mm, that i've yeah. had as well but i guess what is really on my mind right now is mm. that there's confidence which will allow you to do all those things but mm. then there's also what i've seen a lot mm. is fake confidence fake confidence where okay. you're almost putting on the mm. energy that mm-hmm. you're a confident person mm-hmm. and that you can handle the difficulties mm-hmm. and the challenges that mm-hmm. come from a relationship to help you grow and because you're trying to project this image to probably first yourself and then to the world and mm-hmm. to your partner mm-hmm. it means that you never are really able to take accountability for what it takes to do the real work Ooh. Yeah. So, but you know what <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll save this. We'll, 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 we'll come. We'll come. We'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, I think. Okay. I think. We'll, yeah. I think that's, yeah, that's a future episode topic. right there. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So for the last part of the podcast, okay. I have a few dilemmas that I want to um, re- read out to you that okay. we've had sent nice. over from the audience. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So first dilemma is when receiving feedback, even if it's constructive, I take it personally mm-hmm. and I feel a blow to my confidence. How can I learn to accept feedback positively and use it as a tool for growth? Yeah, great question. And that goes back to what I was saying about internalizing it. You know, when you receive feedback, if you take it personal, that's actually a fixed mindset, not a growth mindset. So people with fixed mindset take feedback as a personal attack. And, and you know, it's natural to do that because you have to intentionally learn how not to internalize that positive criticism as something being wrong with you so one of the first things i'll say is who you are and what you do or what is said about you are not the same thing okay for starters you are somebody with worth your worth is intrinsic no one can take that away from you so let's say you had a 10 pound note okay and let's say there was a little rip on the 10 pound note does that 10 pound note does it make it any less worthy that it now has a rip in it. No, if you still take it to the bank, they will accept your money as a 10 pound note. And so the same way your worth is intrinsic, no one can take that away from you. So when you receive some criticism, it doesn't take away your worth. It is simply um, about your perspective, right? If you see it as, okay, this is a chance for me to grow and improve, then it's exciting. If someone gives you, if someone gives me feedback on my speaking, you know, then I'll be like, okay, I want to try that next time because that's going to make me a better speaker, right? But if I start to think, oh, they've given me this feedback because I'm terrible at my job and, you know, I'm going to get fired soon or it means I'm not really good enough, what then happens, you're going down a negative spiral of self-sabotage. So it goes back to what I was saying, sabotaging versus empowering thought. Everything in life comes down to perspective. That is what I'm learning so much as I get older. The meaning you put behind something will influence whether you are positive and move your life forward or are negative and sabotage yourself. So Instead of getting feedback as something is wrong with me, ask yourself, what can I learn from this? What is this here to teach me? And then, you know, set goals to actively improve on those areas. But again, who you are, what happens to you, what is said about you are not the same thing. You are always somebody with worth and see that positive criticism as a way to get better. It's exciting. It's a new challenge. What if this is a challenge that is here to grow you and not break you? It's all down to your perspective. See, I really agree with you on that, but. I think it's easier to apply that mindset to yourself when we're talking about being better at you at work or mm-hmm. being better at business mm-hmm. or, or being a better public speaker. Mm-hmm. But what if your actions that you're getting feedback on is because you've been deeply hurting somebody and it couldn't really make you begin to think, am I actually a good person? 
does anything change in that situation? If your actions hurt someone. It's what you're doing, you're actively and consistently still mm-hmm, hurting people mm-hmm, around mm-hmm. you. It's I know the I know the I know what you said is still true, yeah. but it's a lot harder to take that advice and actually internalize it. Yes. So um that's where ego comes in. Mm. So I was um not to bring this back to relationships, but I think that's kind of where we're going with this is when I was arguing with my partner, when when I said something that upsets him, for example, and he got upset, I was trying to justify why I was a good person and I didn't intentionally try to upset him instead of acknowledging that he was upset and doing what I needed to do to comfort him. I was trying to prove a point that I didn't say anything wrong, whereas he was already upset, you know? And so it's ego because your ego, you want to try and prove to yourself that you're not a bad person, that you didn't mean to upset them, you know, and they're taking it wrong, but that's not helpful in the situation. If you do something that upsets someone and they give you feedback, your first step is to acknowledge that you have hurt them, even if that was not your intention. Mm. You have to acknowledge that you hurt that person. It's not about, it's not always about the intention. Sometimes it's about the impact of your words and your actions. So I stopped, I had to stop being like, oh no, but like, it was just a joke. Come on. Like, and actually be like, oh wow, that hurt you. I'm so sorry. I did not mean to do that. And I completely understand how it could have come across to you. So if you're, if somebody has given you feedback, a friendship, a partner that you've upset them, don't rush to justify why you didn't mean to upset them because that's not helpful for them actually what you need to do is acknowledge their pain acknowledge their hurt reflect on your own actions and see how you can do that differently but it's a tough realization to come to yeah that you've hurt someone without intentionally trying to hurt them yeah yeah without a doubt okay one last dilemma okay and then i'm going to end on my Question I ask everybody. Okay. Um, I'll give you a chance to think about that too, which actually, you know what? I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, final dilemma. Sure. Um, I often find it difficult to voice my opinions in group settings, mm-hmm. fear and judgment or conflict. How do I build confidence and expression my ideas without second guessing myself? Mm, how do you build confidence to express your ideas without second guessing yourself? I think... Again, you know, there's no such thing as like a stupid answer or a stupid question and things like that. And it goes back to the three points I mentioned when a negative thought comes into your head. So let's say you want to speak up in a group setting and your mind goes, oh, what if you say something stupid? You have two choices to shut up because you might say something stupid and you don't want to embarrass yourself or you can ask Hmm, am I 100% going to say something stupid? No, you don't know until you actually say it. Is this sabotaging me from actually speaking up? Yes, it's making me go into my shell, so I don't want to do that. Would I ever say to a friend, oh, in group settings, you shouldn't speak up and you should be quiet because you you might say something that people are going to laugh at you for or judge you? No, I would never say that to a friend. What would I say to a friend in that instance to just speak my truth and say what I have to say. If people like it, great. If they don't, we move on to the next thing. And so those three questions, is it 100% facts? Is it an assumption? Is it sabotaging or empowering? And what would I say to a friend in that situation? If you can quickly ask yourself those three things, and that's what I call in my book, the negative thought detector. It's like a three-step process. You can quickly scan in your mind to decide, is this a thought I want to listen to? Or is this a thought I want to reject and go ahead and do something else so once you do that you'll begin to feel more confident that you know you can go ahead and do it and at the end of the day you don't exist to be liked by everyone Mm. like that's not why you're here you don't exist to please everyone there will be people who like what you have to say and there will be people who don't 
And that's life. I mean, if Beyonce can have haters, who are we, <laughs> mere mortals, <laughs> right? To 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 think everyone's going to like everything that we do. Yeah. So be ready for people to not accept what you have to say and to not like what you have to say. And that's okay, but you're not here to please them. You exist to speak your truth. Mm-hmm. And the more times, every time you want to speak up and you quieten your voice and you shut yourself up, you are sending a message to your subconscious Mm. that your voice doesn't matter yeah and that is going to affect all the different areas of your life in your relationships at work with other people with choices that you make your independence so it is so important that you practice advocating for yourself and being confident yeah it's powerful it's really powerful thank you so final question yes who should we have on the podcast oh next at any point he would you invite oh. for us to have in the future oh oh Fisayo Longe uh, okay. founder um, and director at Kai Collective I think she has such a beautiful story she has been at this fashion business grinding for years and she finally got her breakthrough moment and she's really the kind of person that tries to live on her own terms she took like six months off from her business because she experienced burnout and not a lot of entrepreneurs will take that risk Mm -hmm. to be able to do that and to own it she's built such an amazing community usually every time i do something i'm wearing kai collective because Mm -hmm. the clothes that she makes just makes me feel good and confident and unstoppable so i think yeah she's got a great story and she has really built such a beautiful community and brand and i think loads of entrepreneurs could learn the power of community when it comes to building a successful business so yeah definitely get her on nah no i'll definitely oh i'll be sorry you heard that so (laughs) and i've seen what she's been doing for years and she's been killing it so she has yeah so so on that note, I'm going to say thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast today. You're welcome. Honestly, the words that you shared, I know it's going to definitely impact somebody. Um, amazing work of your book. who is setting up this business thank for you. all the things that you've passed for you to get to this point. Let's keep it up. And in all honesty, I just want to keep on seeing you shine. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also congrats to you too. Like, I know I've said this to you before, but I feel like I want to stay on the podcast. Like, you know, coming to your events back in like 2018, maybe 2017, Mm -hmm. just seeing you being a young person, like filling out rooms, talking about being a dreamer, going after your goals. I was like, wow, this is incredible. If he can do it, I can do it too. So you were a big inspiration to me when I was doing my own confident and killing it events because I saw that I'm a young person. I can make it work. If if Claude can do it, I can do it too. So thank you for everything that you do as well. Yeah, it's my pleasure. You're welcome. Okay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>